Nation Magazine reporter John Nichols has written a whole book about socialism in the USA, The S-Word. It has a long and storied American history, in fact, he says. Last summer, I had a chance to ask John about his book and more. For more information about The S-Word, you can go to our website. I'm John Nichols. I write about politics for The Nation magazine. But one of the things I'm most interested in is social movements and political movements. And one of the things that always strikes me is that we, we have a very poor sense of history as regards our social movements in America. The fact of the matter is that uh, many ideologies have deep roots in this country. You can find libertarian streams that go back to the founding of the republic. You can also find socialist streams that go back to the founding of the republic. Tom Paine's last great uh, pamphlet was called Agrarian Justice, and in it he outlined a, a theory of a social welfare state. In the years that followed, uh, radical activists were often referred to by even the New York Times as red Paineites, i.e. that they were advocating for ideas uh, outlined in agrarian justice, a, a rather social democratic notion. Uh, the Republican Party was clearly founded by uh, many people who identified as social democrats, uh, including some friends of Karl Marx who had immigrated after the 1848 uprisings in Europe. And this just goes on throughout our history. The truth of the matter is America has uh, a very rich, uh, radical, socialist, social democratic history. And when we begin to look at it, what we find is that it didn't always define this country, but it often added ideas to the discourse. And I, I think that's part of our crisis today. Our discourse has become very, very narrow, very defined by wealthy and powerful folks. Uh, and we don't have the inputs that we used to have, uh, demanding Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, demanding civil rights, demanding big changes. Now that's not to say we don't have movements today that are making demands, and some of them are, are rising and we have a new era where we're seeing things happen. But we ought to understand that it was not uncommon in the era of, say, a Franklin Roosevelt to have President Roosevelt sit down and meet with Norman Thomas, who was the socialist candidate for President of the United States, very comfortably uh, to have John Kennedy read socialist Michael Harrington's book, The Other America, and to have Lyndon Johnson invite Harrington, as well as uh, radicals like A. Philip Randolph, uh, to the White House to outline ideas for how to address poverty. What about Lincoln? Well, Lincoln was a fascinating case. Abraham Lincoln was a great reader of Horace Greeley's New York Herald Tribune, or New York Herald Tribune, and, and other publications that Greeley put out over the years. And the important thing to understand is that Karl Marx was uh, Greeley's European correspondent. And so there's very little question that Abraham Lincoln read really radical ideas and read a lot of really radical ideas. And what's interesting is that uh, in a book I did on, on all this, it's interesting that when you listen to Lincoln's speeches, you will find that while I wouldn't even necessarily say he was a social democrat except on some land issues, I think he, he may have been there, but what I will say is that he often integrated language that was clearly radical ideas, class analysis, talking about the importance of labor as re it relates to capital. And you think, well, wow, that's certainly sounding like, like a foreign idea. No, that was something that Abraham Lincoln talked about in his first State of the Union address. Who was Meyer London? Meyer London was uh, an immigrant from Lithuania who came to New York and his father had been a, an activist. Uh, he grew up on the Lower East Side. He became very active in uh, needle trades, uh, you know, the, the unions that, that made clothing. Uh, in the early years of the 20th century, that was a big deal. Meyer London represented many of the rising unions. He was an activist. And in 1914, 100 years ago, Meyer London filed his paperwork to run for the United States Congress as a socialist. He ran against a Democrat and a Republican from the Lower East Side, and he was elected. Now, what's fascinating about this was uh, when he was elected, it wasn't that big a deal because in New York City, there was a large social democratic socialist movement there, and, and uh, it wasn't that shocking to people. He went up to Congress and served in Congress as a very bold, very radical player, as did another socialist elected from Milwaukee two years earlier, Victor Berger. And, and I think this is one of the things that people ought to understand, that historically, we have had socialists sit in our Congress. Uh, we've had social democrats sit in our Congress. We've had uh, some very, very radical people there. And they have not 
hectored from the sidelines, they have often framed out ideas and, and important ideas. And Meyer London, uh, as we note the 100th anniversary of his election to Congress, was someone who was a, a great leader on a host of economic issues, health care issues, social justice issues, trade union issues, framing out much of what would become the New Deal, but also on issues like anti-Semitism and civil rights. And this is an important part of our history. When we deny third parties, and I will say third parties of the right and the left, and groupings that are outside of our mainstream politics, when we deny that history, we, we, de we don't understand how things happen. Things happen when people on the Lower East Side of New York elect a guy like Meyer London to Congress.